asked Dick to, to share some of his experience, especially uh, from the industrial point of view, as to how the, how the working waterfront in San Diego has evolved and, and, and his, his view about that. Dick's a member of uh, many boards, including the National Sea Grant Advisory Board and also the National Academies of Science Marine Board. He's a native of San Francisco, a graduate of UC Berkeley, and lives in La Jolla with his wife. Uh, it gives me really great pleasure to introduce uh, Dick Bortman to moderate this panel. So Dick, it's all yours. Uh, thank you, Jim, and good morning, everybody, and welcome to our panel. And again, I, I echo the thanks for everybody sticking around, not only for our panel, but maybe even more importantly for the strategy session that, that's going to follow uh, right after us. But the, the title of our, our panel today is The Challenges of the Working Waterfront Nationwide. And you all know that we've had some a very intense two days, uh, a great deal of discussion, a great deal of information has been disseminated that stimulated a lot of thinking uh, and, a lot, as I said, a lot of discussion about that. Our purpose here today is we are going to hear from um, industry leaders from the different segments of the working wharf waterfront around the country and allow them to reflect on what they've heard in the last two days and how it affects their particular segment of the working waterfront, uh, what's happened in the past, what they're struggling with currently, and, and how, how they see the future unfolding and what challenges and what opportunities uh, that represents. Um, let me start off by just explaining uh, my role here uh, as the moderator. I, I really am here in, in two capacities. Jim alluded to this, but first, I do serve on the National uh, uh, Sea Grant Advisory Board. Uh, this board is created by Congress, and our role is to uh, assist and advise NOAA and the National Sea Grant Office in how to efficiently and effectively utilize the taxpayers' money in the pursuit of the research, educational, and outreach efforts on the coastal communities and, and the coastal waters. Uh, one of our responsibilities is also to report back to the Congress every two years uh, with an evaluation of uh, our perception of how well uh, the Sea Grant program has been utilizing those, those dollars and pass on any recommendations back to Congress as what, if anything, we think can, can be improved. Um, Many of you are well aware of the, of the Sea Grant program. Uh, many of you are participants in it. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, there are four focus areas uh, for Sea Grant, uh, healthy uh, coastal ecosystems, safe, sustainable uh, seafood supply, hazard resi resilient coastal communities, and sustainable coastal developments. Now, the working waterfront manifests itself in all four of those focused areas. And I am I'm one of the few non-scientists on the advisory board. Uh, and, and because of my industrial background, I have a particular interest uh, in, in the working waterfront. And I have to say, I, I am very proud and, and pleased to see the role that the National Sea Grant Program has taken in asserting itself into the working waterfront issues. And this conference itself, I certainly congratulate and commend the Larson Sea Grant, Oregon Sea Grant for taking the initiative and putting forth all the effort to put on this, this conference this, this week. Now, the second capacity uh, in which I'm here today, and Jim alluded to, is, is I will represent the heavy industrial sector of the working waterfront. And I emphasize heavy. Uh, Jim mentioned my background in shipbuilding. I spent a 30-year career at National Steel and Shipbuilding in San Diego. Um, in addition to that, I was born and raised in San Francisco, and my father spent a 40-year career in shipbuilding in San Francisco. Uh, I found it a little interesting in a couple of the uh, sessions earlier uh, this week where the San Francisco folks were talking about the waterfront and the maritime sector and, the, and what was referred to as the ship repair uh, activities in San Francisco. And I was wondering whether they were even old enough to remember that San Francisco used to be a huge ship building community. Uh, there were at least three shipyards there that I can remember as a kid uh, growing up, but they're all gone. It wasn't a result of any of the working waterfront issues we're talking about here. It was a result of market forces, but nonetheless, it was a significant change on the, on the working waterfront in, in San Francisco. Anyway, I've been around, uh, probably seen the majority of all the shipyards around the world, so I, I, I have a, a 
gut feel that I know shipyards, so I will be adding my perspective in this discussion from how the shipbuilding industry or heavy industrial activities interface in with the working waterfront. With that, let me introduce our, our four panelists today. Um, we have Rick Lidecker, Assistant Vice President uh, uh, for Government Affairs at Boat US. We have Peter Phillips, President of the Phillips Publishing Group here in Seattle. We have Bill Dewey, Manager of Public Policy and Communications for the Taylor Shellfish uh, Organization here in Washington. And for those of you who had a chance to read the newspaper today, you'll know he's a, he's a celebrity in the, in the national front with his picture in the paper. Uh, and we have Rob Snyder, president of the Inland Institute in Maine. Now, if I could ask each one of you, just take a minute. To, if you'd just introduce yourself and, and explain a little bit about your professional background that, that got you to where you are today before we start our session. So, Rick. Okay. Yeah, I, I uh, am uh, assistant vice president for government affairs for Boat US, the Boat Owners Association. We represent uh, recreational boaters. Uh, nationwide. Uh, by way of background, I also wear another hat, I'm associate editor of the magazine, and I came at this f with, uh, from a journalism background, actually cut my teeth writing about boating and fishing and, uh, a long time ago, and then migrated into the Sea Grant program as a communicator for Minnesota Sea Grant, and then found my way back to Washington, D.C., and spent some time with NOAA and the Office of Sea Grant, and then moved into Boat U.S. Uh, so the, the public policy side sort of uh, adhered to me as I went along in the journalism. Rob. Thanks. Um, so I'm Rob Snyder. I'm uh, president-elect at the Island Institute in Rockland, Maine, and um, been there around 11 years. And when I got involved with the organization, I was fortunate to have the opportunity to begin working with some of the folks who are here in the room today. Um, folks at CEI, Maine Aquaculture, um, Maine Sea Grant, uh, and ended up in the position of, at least uh, for a while, chairing the Maine Working Waterfront Coalition, or co-chairing it, and um, driving a lot of the policy changes that ended up um, changing the landscape of where the working waterfront debate in the country, s around small communities and small waterfronts. Uh, good morning, I'm Bill Dewey. So I, uh, I'm director of public policy and communications for Taylor Shellfish Farms. And then on the side, I also have a shellfish farm of my own uh, up in northern Puget Sound. I grow manila clams. And Taylor's, uh, Taylor family has been farming shellfish here in Washington State since 1890. And in, in the last couple decades have grown to be uh, the largest producer of farm shellfish in North America. We've got farms throughout Puget Sound, out on the Washington coast, up in British Columbia hatcheries here in Washington, in Hawaii, big nursery in California, about 500 employees. I started my career uh, with a degree in shellfish biology from the School of Fisheries here at UW back in 1981. Worked as a shellfish farmer, worked into farm management, and then got into public policy probably about 20 years ago. Uh, and don't have any professional training there. That's all come from the School of Hard Knocks and just out there working on policy issues both for tailors and also for our industry through the Pacific Coast Shellfish Growers Association. My name is Peter Phillips. I'm the president of Phillips Publishing Group. And our, my complete biography is in your program, so I won't go over it. But I will tell you that uh, uh, we have four trade journals in the commercial maritime and commercial fishing field, all West Coast publications for the most part. We have one national publication that we publish for the Passenger Vessel Association. Uh, I was born and raised in Seattle. My father was the um, editor of National Fisherman and then Fisherman's News before starting Pacific Maritime Magazine, where I went to work for him uh, in 1985 after graduating from college. My brother joined us, and we are now, Chris, Chris and I are uh, now running the company. Uh, I'm also president of the Seattle Marine Business Coalition, which is a 501c6 a nonprofit organization registered in the state of Washington to represent marine industrial land users. Uh, it's the only such organization that I know of on the West Coast, and uh, so we've been involved. I've been involved in that organization as president for 10 years. Uh, I was a commercial fisherman, or I was in the industry. I worked on tenders when I was growing up, so I 
kind of started uh, in the industry when I was about 17 and was fishing from the age of 17 to 22 uh, on tenders in uh, Bristol Bay during the summer. I should provide the caveat that I was not involved in uh, maritime industrial policy. I was much more interested in getting enough gas money for my uh, 69 Ford Falcon, of which I was very, very proud at that time. <laughs> Hi, th thank you, gentlemen. The structure we'll follow today is each of our panelists will uh, take some 10 minutes to give us an introduction of their sector of the working waterfront and then start to talk about the challenges and, and opportunities that they face. Uh, we'll also give them an opportunity to ask questions to one another uh, from one sector to another. Uh, I will have a few questions, but we also want to uh, allow ample time for questions from, from you folks. So I believe we were going to have cards. There are cards being passed around. If you would write down your questions, uh, and we'll send them up here. And we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Uh, but with that, let's get started. Rick, uh, you're up first. Thank you, Dick. Um, let me see here. If does this work? That. Is that, Nicole, is this the thing? I'll just use, use this thing. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. People up here. Well, that was that was the next step. And there was something up there already, so I wondered how that was possible. Yep. Okay, now how do I move? Okay. You just um, space move bar. the slides with the space bar. The space bar is the best. Just so don't. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Problem was we didn't have enough duct tape on the uh, connection here. Yeah, that's the secret. Okay. This has been an outstanding conference. I really, really appreciate the commitment that the Washington and Oregon Sea Grant programs have put behind this, this conference. It's, it's been terrific, and I know there was somebody working on the waterfront last night. That fish was terrific. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, I wanted, I'm, I'm glad to see we have such a, a good cross-section of, of people here in a very comprehensive forum that brought the, the right people together. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have as big a crowd as we had the uh, previous two days, but the, I think we have the right people here in this room now to examine the working waterfront issues of today, which in my mind are rather different than they were um, six years ago when we, this, uh, we met in Norfolk, Virginia for the first symposium. Virginia is my home state uh, for Boat US, and I want to tell you briefly how we got here to Tacoma, Washington from Norfolk, Virginia. Recreational boating is the $33 billion industry in this country in terms of boat sales and services. It supports 350,000 jobs. Uh, the total economic Im impact is $72 billion. There are uh, 12.4 million registered recreational boats in the country. And in 2011, 83 million people went boating at least once. And I tried to do the math on that. I thought, wait a minute, 12 million boats, 83 million people. I, I guess boaters have more friends, huh? <laughs> so you can see boating is a significant industry. In Florida, it's bigger than the citrus industry, by the way. But boaters have to have access to the water and to the facilities and the water-dependent businesses that support our, our recreation. Public marinas, working boat yards, small craft launching areas allow the public to participate in boating, fishing, and other water sports, and then keep that industry side going. Well, back in uh, 2004, 2005, we began to hear from our Boat US members around the country that they're losing marina slips, launching ramps, uh, 
uh, transient landings in many areas, uh, boat yards for repair and haul out. Uh, for, but it wasn't just the recreational boaters and the sport anglers, depending on where you looked. You, they were commercial fishermen, um, charter fishing operations, tour boat operators, yacht brokers. They were uh, losing access to the water, and the small businesses that served us were losing their, their places of business, the marine mechanics, prop shops, chandleries, canvas shops. All those mom and pop businesses that supported us, and de they depended on that working waterfront that we all needed. And we, this, at the time, we called this condo creep. Basically, we heard some of it yesterday. Uh, these small businesses, marinas, boat yards, were being taxed out of their waterfront real estate as the sites were converted to waterfront living residential development. Um, and, and that's the burning barn, by the way. I also uh, began to notice that local jurisdictions were coming up with various ways to deal with the loss of working waterfronts. And, uh, in Florida, voters passed a constitutional amendment, I think it was 2005 and, or six, by a 72% margin that enshrined recreational and commercial working waterfronts language into uh, state real estate property tax law in order to keep the marinas and boat yards viable. Other parts of the country were tackling the problem from slightly different angles. We've heard uh, in some of the sessions what Maine had been doing, uh, North Carolina also. So I thought, why don't we bring all these, the collective experience of all these people around the country that are dealing with these problems, solving these problems, and bring them together under one roof and share the information and see what, we, what worked here or there and get that distributed elsewhere. So I discussed my idea for this kind of a forum with Dr. Tom Murray from Virginia Sea Grant. And Tom did what Sea Grant Marine Advisory folks do so well. He framed the opportunity and he found some seed money, put together a steering committee. Some of you were on that steering committee. And um, the steering committee then put out a call for papers. Uh, they found additional sponsors and hey, we had us the first National Working Waterfront Symposium. And I know, were any of you there uh, at that first one, the very first in Norfolk? Okay, well then you might remember that in kicking off that session, uh, I said the three most important words in recreational boating then were access, access, and help me, access, you remember it. Okay, good, you were there. That was in May 2007. And back then, baby boomers like me we're buying up our retirement homes on the water, you know, and we, were, we all know what happened soon after that, right? Uh, the real estate market crashed, took the steam out of the, and the money out of that waterfront land rush, and then the recession hit, and today, boomers like me are still working. The real estate market's coming back, as we know, and, but I see another concern on the horizon, and that's what I call the rush to deep water. Now you want to know what I see as the three most important words in recreational boating today? Containers, containers, containers. Got it. Well, why do I say this? I don't know, maybe just a hunch. Now I'm sure everyone here is aware that the uh, newly expanded Panama Canal, it's scheduled to open it was supposed to be next year, I believe it's 2015, and as a result, U.S. ports are scrambling to accommodate this post-Panamax trade. It's supposed to see a doubling of cargoes over the next two de decades, and there's a half a dozen uh, major ports out east that are competing to dredge 50-foot channels and expand the shoreside cargo handling capacity while a lot of secondary ports are, are um, and trying to expand to capture the distribution of that domestic cargo via water uh, through the inland rivers and, and in coastwide trade. Well, but it's not just that Panama Canal trade to the eastern seaboard. Ports are trying to expand here on the west coast, as I learned a lot about in the last two days, in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, so, so what? Has it got to do with the recreational boater? What's it got to do with the 
person on, you know, where I live on the Chesapeake Bay. Or even with your own Governor Inslee here on his Ranger tug cruising in Puget Sound. Well, one aspect is pretty obvious. Much bigger ships carrying much more cargo at much faster speeds and with much less crew, the message is pretty clear. Watch out for us. But uh, what about ashore? What are the implications to be found for recreational boating in these deeper channels and the bigger than ever container uh, marshalling yards that are coming? Or to put it another way, will an expanding canal a couple thousand miles um, away from where I am gobble up recreational boating facilities? And what about all these anticipated new uses of offshore waters that has so many people engaged in this, uh, this new discipline called marine spatial planning? We've talked about that here uh, in, in a number of the forums the, the past two days. There's a lot of talk back where I live about uh, putting offshore wind farms in Delaware, Maryland, Virginia coast. And I've read that wave energy is actually generating juice out here off the Oregon coast. And uh, I understand our own Nicole Fagan is working on the tidal power generation feasibility for Puget Sound. Um, and of course, there's always the underwater oil and gas extraction, aquaculture operations going on. And I thought, hey, all these industries, they use boats, right? So maybe the small commercial vessels that, wor at, that work on all of these emerging uh, ocean uses can help keep the boat yards and the marinas and the service businesses in operation. But then I saw what an offshore wind farm vessel looks like, and um, well, that won't be tying up at my marina, I guess. So when these new uses are realized, it very likely will create maybe more demand for waterfront property. I mean, for you know, the initial construction stages of some of these projects, like wind farms, or access points for their regular operations or maintenance offshore, sites for inland distribution of whatever it is, their products and services. I mean, those power lines have to come ashore somewhere from the wind farms, right? So my point is, and the, unless officials, uh, commissioners, professional staff from ports large and small, as well as uh, coastal planners, policymakers, people like you in this room start thinking about these things and begin taking some action now. I fear that this demand for waterfront access will dwarf the residential demand that we saw in the previous decade. But will it come at the expense of the marinas, boatyards, small boat facilities that we need? that fall in my definition of working waterfronts? And does it have to be that way? After all, many ports or port authorities are great partners for recreational boating, particularly out here in the West, I've, I've, I've learned. And they operate or concession recreational marinas, uh, mooring fields, boat haul out and repair facilities that, that serve all of us. And all those recreational marina slips actually serve them, the ports, as their bridge, if you will, to the community, the local community, their boating neighbors. So to sum up, my suggestion to you here, maybe we'll talk about this in the strategy session, that um, we, if you're in, the, in any way involved or influencing the kind of port expansion that we see on the horizon, just remember that recreational boating is, an extre is extremely important to our working waterfronts and not to mention to the quality of life in port cities like Tacoma. So just don't throw the boater out with the deep water, please. Thank you. All right, thank you, Rick. I think we'll hold questions until we get through all four of our speakers, and then, we, then we'll open up for, for questions. So uh, Rob, or sure. Thank you, and I just want to say that um, Tacoma is beautiful. I've been really impressed um, as somebody who's not been here before, who spent a lot of time on the main coast, which is in itself a stunning place to live and a, and a great place to be, to come to a place where there's such an um, active 
and kind of energizing debate about the waterfront and to see so much progress. You know, having talked to somebody last night who'd grown up here for 50 years, seen the changes, see, seen the city go through some really hard times and to come back like this is um, just a real privilege to be here. And um, it really helps me think more about the challenges and how, how, how we fit in. And so I think I'll just, I mean, I, and as I'm sitting on this panel, I'm thinking, man, I can't imagine the debate it took to get me onto this panel. Because I'm, <laughs> because when you talk about the diversity, you know, this, this is, there are industries and then there are communities, right? And, um, and I am representing small communities today, um, which is a really, um, I, I think it's a very thoughtful, I'm very pleased that there's the opportunity to speak from this point of view. Because um, in fact, I feel like one of the threads that might allow us to navigate all the various uses is in fact the fa that, that we are anchored in communities as we have these discussions. Um, you know, I'm from the coast of Maine. There are 15 unbridged year-round island communities off the coast of Maine. The Island Institute works to support the sustainability of those communities, but we also work very hard to exchange ideas and information to further the sustainability of communities everywhere. And because we believe that if you can, you have, we have a lot to learn from the work that small communities do to remain viable. And what's really um, striking to me in the discussions I've been a part of over the last couple of days is that um, as well, while each industry has very important reasons to be a part of this discussion, um, in many ways the there are hundreds of small communities around the coast of the United States that will cease to exist if we don't get this right. Um, I'll tell you a, a brief story about a town called Islesford, part of the Cranberry Isles off of Mount Desert Island. Um, it's off of Northeast Harbor, which is probably home to the greatest concentration of highest net worth individuals in the country. And um, the town of the Cranberry Isles in uh, early 2000s was finding that it was increasingly hard to park on the mainland so that they could get to their community where they lived. And the town at, on the other side, on the on northeast, which is, you know, so, and of Mount Desert Island is a causewayed um, island community, so we don't count them, but still, Natalie would. And, um, but, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, transportation, as the infrastructure to maintain transportation <coughs> for that island community of 70 people, 20 fishermen, was absolutely essential to their future. And what they ended up needing to do to sustain themselves was to buy a piece of land on the mainland that they could own so that they could make sure that they could always get to their island to maintain their community. The private ferry service that served them needed that access. The people who needed to park a car so they could go get their groceries needed that access. And today, the fishermen, there's two or 20 uh, of that 70, are really struggling to figure out how they're going to retain access on the mainland. Um, they're very much uh, captive to one or two points where they have to drop their product to the mainland um, to, to trucks that take their lobsters um, to processing across the Northeast. And so, you know, they are, they are one of, you know, what I've found to be in the lower 48, there are about 90 of these unbridged year-round island communities with about 115,000 people living on them that seriously will not exist if we can't figure out a place for the transportation needs, the flow of goods, the flow of energy in many cases to these communities. And so, um, and it, which is a much broader frame than I initially brought to this issue when we got involved in the first place because when we got involved in the first place it was very much about the fact that commercial fishermen, small boat commercial fishermen, lobstermen on the coast of Maine were getting squeezed out by the transition of real estate towards um, res residential uses that were seasonal, right? This is it's a common and old story and in the mid 80s, I'm sorry, in the mid 2000s it was, you know, the barn was in full it was a full force fire going on. And um, you know, the fact of the matter is the coast of Maine's real estate never slumped during the recession. Um, it means it's the values remain stable um, and the communities remain unaffordable. And the idea that a small boat fisherman would be able to buy an access point going forward is almost 
unachievable to think about. And so for, for the people that I work with and the communities that I um, value and want to see survive, this is, a, this is a very important debate that's going on here. Um, we've been having this debate for a long time in Maine, and one of the really heartening things to being here as part of this discussion is to see how many new people are coming up every couple years. That, that the audience is growing, that the number of voices involved are more diverse, that the identity of what a working waterfront is isn't settled, and maybe it shouldn't be. Maybe it should be something that we always will be debating. Because if we continue debating it, the answers we get to solving the problems are going to get more creative. Um, and I think that's really important. Now, it doesn't help in a policy environment, but you know, we can, we can settle on definitions here and there as necessary. Um, I also want to just think, uh, talk about the fact that for these communities, um, and the small communities that I work with in particular, they need friends on the mainland. They need friends in big ports. They need friends, you know, in fact, the reason that we were able to be successful at all in Maine was because the fishermen themselves weren't a big enough constituency. They needed the farmers and the foresters, you know? Um, and I'd say nationally, if any of us want any of what we want, we're gonna need each other. Uh, you just can't do this stuff alone. And I can tell you as an incredibly marginal group in this discussion, um, you know, we have some of the most compelling voices that will help you succeed. Um, and so the storytelling is critical and we have the stories and we need to be a part of the discussion so we can help tell them. Um, and I guess the, the other point I'll make is the sense that um, I really liked that, uh, that, that we're looking towards, that it's important to think about the waterfront looking at it from the water. Um, and for me, that's a very um, natural concept because of the, because for, for, for all of the communities that I work with, um, the water is part of the community's territory. Um, the water is, you know, the working waterfront as an edge, at, at the edge of the water is in fact the center of the community. It's not the edge of land. It's actually the middle of where everybody organizes their lives. And so um, I think that sense that we're talking about something that's very central to the future of our coasts as opposed to on the edges of it was really evidenced in the discussion about the economics of working waterfronts that was in the plenary yesterday. The fact that um, you can actually point to more than a percent of the GDP that is absolutely driven by the decisions that we're making. Um, and the fact that this is only a six-year-old discussion means that it's brand new. Um, and there's a long way to go towards figuring out how to frame that message and that story and that imbalance of federal and state support to make sure that we can continue to um, advance our cause. I also just think it's really valuable that fact that we need each other is evidence. So I'm, I'm from Rockland. Rockland's 4,500 people. Um, it's the stepping off point for Vinyl Haven, North Haven, Matinicus Islands. Um, Rockland is home to O'Hara Corporation. The, uh, the big boats that fish out of Seattle and in Alaska that are owned by O'Hara are run out of Rockland. The, biz, the family all lives around me. They are really cool people. They just did a major infrastructure project in our town because the lobster fishery uses a ton of bait fish. That bait fish is hard to find in the Northeast now. They're bringing in racks from the West Coast, from their fleet over here. I mean, we're completely connected. Our fishing fleet does not survive without the fishing fleet over here now. I mean, it's just completely globalized, nationalized discussion that is um, all based around the, the, the working waterfront and the infrastructure that connects it. So, um, you know, I think I'll just close by staying, saying that, you know, it's, it is, for us, it is still um, access to the water, access to the mainland, access to capital, access to fish, access to each other. Um, and the stories that it's going to take in order to demonstrate that that's a worthwhile cause and should be a high priority at the highest offices in the country. So thank you. Thank you, Rob. Bill?
Well, Nicole's uh, getting that set up. Thanks, Nicole. Um, I just want to say, as I was uh, invited to participate on the panel, I had to uh, feel like I was the odd man out because shellfish farming, uh, I think as you'll see through some of my slides, is not the traditional working front, waterfront that many of you think of as far as our ports and, and shipping and so on. Uh, considerably different, but certainly in, in our eyes here in Washington, uh, very much a working waterfront, but uh, we'll have a different image than what you're used to. And, and different problems than perhaps what you're used to. And, and after seeing the list of attendees that you circulated, I could see I was, I definitely was the odd man out. Uh, and, and then when we saw the sign up, we put together an aquaculture tour and got a grand total of one person to sign up for it. So again, an indication that maybe there's not a lot of interest in this audience on, on our industry. So then we tried to bribe you a little bit last night. So hopefully you got to enjoy some of the food from our farms and maybe think, uh, <laughs> Starting to recognize that, okay, these guys got something to offer here. Uh, and, and we definitely have some challenges, quite frankly, and you'll see, and, and could probably use your help and some of your good thinking on that. So, so uh, with that, I'll launch in. We have a long history here in Washington State. They got bumped. Uh, oh, duct tape. Yeah, I know. It's I'll be careful. Old. I'll try to be careful here. Sorry. So, no, no, no problem at all. You look fine here. I know. I look great. <laughs> So, long history here in Washington State, uh, 1800s wild fishery for native oyster, uh, and like a lot of wild fisheries, uh, an over-harvest situation. And so shortly after statehood, uh, we actually uh, passed some laws to try to fix that problem, and it was what I would call our early foray into uh, marine spatial planning. So 1895, we passed the Bush Act and the Callow Act that allowed for tidelands to be sold into private ownership specifically for the purpose of growing native oysters at the time. The laws later changed to let us grow other shellfish, but uh, about 47,000 acres uh, were eventually sold under two laws, the Bush Act and the Callow Act, that, that had that provision specifically for growing shellfish. Washington also opted to sell other tidelands that were associated with upland parcels adjacent, we refer to those as second-class tidelands, and we grow shellfish on those as well. But if you own a waterfront home, you own the, the tidelands in front of your house out to a certain depth, depending on when it was deeded from the state. And, and, and so uh, interesting. it's set up an interesting uh, dichotomy, and I think the yellow uh, polygons in the water there are probably hard to see, but those are an example of the Bush Act tidelands. So, they're disassociated with the upland parcels adjacent. They have meets and bounds descriptions. They're polygons out in the water, and that works pretty good if they're uh, a distance offshore, which we have big tides here in Washington, so that's often the case, but where the parcels are butt right up against the, the uh, upland owners, then we run into a use conflict situation where we have this industrial operation right out in front of a residence, and they don't own that beach in front of their house, and some of them think they do. And, and so it sets us up for some interesting conflicts there. Some typical images here just of a, a shellfish farm working waterfront. Uh, the industry for many years had our processing plants and retail stores right on the waterfront. Those are fewer and far between anymore because of the property taxes associated with that waterfront. Uh, a lot of us have moved our processing facilities inland and just remain, uh, maintain ingress and egress uh, to the beaches. Some pictures of the farms there where we do oyster culture. Uh, as the industries evolved over the last century, so have uh, the species and methods we use. Uh, and so just quickly, so you get some pictures of what we're doing out there on our tide flats. This is traditional bottom culture of oysters. More recently, the market has shifted to single oyster production, very different process for the industry, but uh, now we're growing beds of single oysters. They're more vulnerable to predation, so in a lot of cases we grow those single oysters in plastic mesh bags to keep the predators from eating, eating them. Some of us have gone recently to a new flipping bag system that rotates up and down with the tide and, and uh, gives the oysters a unique shape and uh, better shelf life. Manila clam culture uh, has evolved in recent years too. Uh, this is actually a picture in the lower left of the picture of my farm up in Skagit County, northern Puget Sound, where I've mechanized the clam farm and grow the clams in rows and mechanized the harvest and so on. Uh, 
manila clam bag culture upper right, and then traditional manila clam culture where we're just blanket farming the beach and hand harvesting them. Mussel culture is done on rafts. This is a little more controversial because you have an aesthetic impact with a floating structure out in the water, uh, much more difficult to get permitted. In fact, I think we maybe have the record, the all-time record for the longest, maybe to get any project permitted, I'm not sure. We've been working, uh, we have two mussel farms now in South Sound, Southern Puget Sound. We've been working for 16 years now to get our third one permitted. It'll take up about five acres of surface water, uh, roughly 50 rafts that are uh, 30 by 34 feet. We've spent, like I say, 16 years and probably close to $2 million uh, in the process, and we still are still not very close. We've still got a ways to go. Uh, I think we're gonna get there, but. Uh, gooey ducks is a, a newer, Species for us, we've been farming these since the early 1990s. It's a large burrowing clam, some of you may be familiar with. This is a, a nursery system we've developed in recent years. There's the clam in the lower left, famous for their long siphon and, and giant size. Again, an aesthetic impact, uh, only visible at low tide. When we put these nursery tubes in for the first, first year or two of a six-year crop, those nursery tubes are in the beach and has generated some complaints on view shed. Um, at the same time, our industry's evolved, so has the land use adjacent to our farms as shoreline properties have sold and, and intensive uh, residential development. With that uh, comes a suite of, of uh, issues, both from a water quality standpoint as well as user conflicts where you've got the industrial farming going on next to the shoreline development, water pollution coming down from that shoreline development, and, and maybe domestic animals or things like that associated with the, the residences. And, Significant contributor to the economy. Uh, in, in, here in Washington State, we estimate about 3,200 people are directly or indirectly employed, about a $270 million economic contribution. In rural, rural western Washington, it's a significant employer. Mason County, where I live, it's the second largest private employer. Out on the coast in Pacific County, it's the largest private employer. Just between those two counties, the annual payroll is estimated to be about $27 million a year, which you know, it doesn't sound like a lot, but when you get in these small communities, those dollars, buying houses, buying cars, buying groceries is a, is a significant contribution. So, so here's my barn burners for you. So, so we've been doing this for a lot of years, and, and, and you know, we ourselves create some use conflict because we need clean water, and the shoreline uh, users uh, that contribute to water pollution don't always appreciate the fact that we're out there complaining and need this clean water, and that started back in the 40s and 50s with the pulp mills here in Washington State and the effluent from the mills killing our oysters and, and us taking on the, the industry and lawsuits and so on. And then more recently that same trend has continued with non-point pollution uh, from failing septics and stormwater and so on. We spend a lot of time advocating, that's a lot of the work I do in the legislature and so on, is trying to get stronger regulations that will protect our areas from water pollution. And then more recently, and this is the one that was mentioned earlier, uh, in, in ocean acidification has been a, a real challenge for us. Uh, and that's what's on the front page of USA Today, an article about that and how it's impacting us uh, currently, our ability to produce oyster seed. So, so I tend to be uh, an optimist and, and um, you know, we, we have been reactive for a lot of years as an industry and we've tried to shift that and, and become proactive, not reactive, and, and create our fate. And so in that effort, in that endeavor, as NOAA and the Obama administration were updating their aquaculture policies, we got very engaged in that process and we urged uh, the administration and NOAA to actually do something with those policies once they finalized them and announced them. And, and so we lobbied hard, the shellfish community around the country lobbied hard to have them launch a national shellfish initiative to implement that policy, which in fact they did. And you may have heard about that, some of you who attended the aquaculture session yesterday. And, and here in Washington State, we were able to get our Governor Gregoire, then Governor Gregoire, very engaged and excited about that as well. She, she got her natural resource cabinet working over the course of a few months to develop a Washington shellfish initiative. And we had a, a wonderful press event and launch of that with Dr. Lubchenko, the head of NOAA and the governor, and just getting them to use the bully pulpit and say shellfish aquaculture is a good thing has really helped shift the pendulum in our favor. It's been amazing to us how just that, 
uh, and just a, a whole suite of newspaper articles and, and key leaders saying positive things about shellfish aquaculture and the jobs that it creates and the ecosystem services it provides. It, it shows up in different policy forums that I'm involved in that I never dreamed it would, you know, where people are saying, well, we have to do this because of the shellfish initiative, you know, and I'm thinking, yeah, right, you know, good idea. You know? <laughs> So, so anyhow, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, we've also done a lot of things as an industry to try to be responsive to, to use conflicts. We spend a lot of time on outreach and education. Our company spends about a million dollars a year on attorneys and consultants and on our own public affairs team that's out there working these issues constantly. Uh, we do um, a lot of festivals. We have a lot of shellfish festivals, Mussel Fest, Oyster Fest, Gooey Duck Festival, uh, to get the public engaged positively about this working waterfront. And that's, that's helped tremendously. Do lots of tours on our farms. Any of you that regret not coming out now? And that tour, by the way, finished up at our restaurant, you know, so <laughs> you really did miss out. <laughs> so, anyhow, I, I'm really looking forward to the strategy session and, and learning more from all of you folks. Uh, how we can address some of our issues. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And, and Bill was very modest in referring to the, the ink that, that, that his issues got in the paper today. Those of you who haven't seen USA Today, I, I encourage you to uh, take a look at it. it to, to me, it, it's surprising the amount of, of, of lines that were devoted to the subject matter as well as this, the, the very dramatic picture that was included in the, in the paper. But I, I urge you to read it, and, and it's indicative of the effort that they put forth to, to get their issues out in front of the public. Uh, okay, Peter. Uh, Dick, if you don't mind, I'm going to speak from here. Uh, it's closer to my notes. <laughs> uh, my great-grandfather arrived in Stillicum, Washington uh, in 1890 from uh, Green Bank, Delaware, where he has had the misfortune of being the third son of a mill-owning family. There was no work for him, so he came out here, which is how most of the European settlers arrived. For those of you who aren't familiar with the region, uh, it was settled in 1850 by European settlers. Before that, there were, there were native populations, and very few of them. When my great-grandfather arrived uh, and settled just west of Tacoma, uh, the Tacoma Tide Flats and all of what is now known as Old Town and Proctor were filled with boatyards. Those boatyards consisted of a, probably a Croatian family uh, who would build a boat and then go out and seine fish for it. Um, many people don't know that the Croatians invented purse seining and brought it here to the Puget Sound and made literally millions for millions of people. There were also Norwegians who were fishing as well. Uh, and there were a whole host of waterfront communities that had sprung up because they were uniquely placed geographically. They were adjacent to very deep water on one side and tall stands of timber on the other. And clipper ships, sailing clipper ships from around the world, would come to Puget Sound to get fitted with their masts because Puget Sound was one of the few places that had those long straight stands of timber and deep water, both of which were absolutely essential for a clipper ship that had a huge keel, and we did not have the technology at the time to splice mast. Uh, those communities were connected not by roads. There were no roads in Puget Sound at that time. They were connected by what, by what we called the Mosquito Fleet, the very first marine transit and marine cargo transportation systems. Today, the commercial fishing industry in Washington State represents 3.9 billion dollars. We have the largest commercial fishing fleet in the country in the North Pacific fishing fleet based here. We have the largest uh, ferry system in the Washington State ferry systems. And we have the largest tug and barge fleet. We're their third largest uh, ocean load center. The containers that Rick talked about earlier were the third largest load center. We're an enormous industry. We are also newly the base for the um, oil and gas resource extraction exploration that's going on in the North, uh, North Pacific. And we're also home ports to a lot of what I call the speculative energy development, which is tidal energy and wave energy. All of that requires extensive uh, commercial vessel support, engines, naval architects, lawyers, insurers. They all need maritime expertise. 
So today, the commercial maritime industry in Puget Sound represents in total $10 billion in economic activity annually. That's for King County alone. This is according, these numbers I'm going to give you are taken from a maritime economic impact study that the City of Seattle commissioned in 2008. And if any of you have any strings with the City of Seattle, I don't see Rocky De Herrera here today, but we would love to have that economic impact study updated because these numbers are from 2008, 2009 actually. So $10 billion annually in economic activity at King County, 22,000 direct jobs. Those jobs pay an average of $70,750 a year. And this to me is the most important component of this economic impact study, which was completed in mid-2009 and released. This is two years into the recession. During the period 2004 through the release date, maritime employment grew 3% and payroll grew 20%. We were very, very little affected by the recession because we are not dependent on the consumer vagaries of the economy. We're long-term, stable, uh, strategic, globally connected local jobs. Briefly, the future is very bright for the commercial maritime industry in Puget Sound. Uh, recent changes to the American Fisheries Act, which is the federal legislation that governs most of our deep water fisheries, fisheries uh, mean that we're able now to rebuild a commercial fishing fleet that is on the order of 20, 25 years old because they've been prohibited from rebuilding their boats. Uh, Senator Maria Cantwell uh, um, passed an amendment to the Fisheries Act which was a safety amendment that said that these commercial fishermen could now rebuild their boats. Uh, they've been very successful with the rationalization program, which we might get into if people are interested. It's, it's quite complex, but the result is that they now all have set quotas which have an economic collateral which can be used to, um, to get bank loans to build new boats. And we're seeing that start to happen. At our annual Bering Sea Fisheries Conference last year, uh, the uh, Experts together told us that we're going to be looking at $40 billion in new vessel construction over the next 25 years. All of those boats have to be built in the United States. They don't have to be built in Puget Sound, but the owners of those boats are here, including one of the O'Hara's, by the way, who just bought $2 million worth of industrial land to, uh, to do we don't know what, but we're hoping it's to build a boat. In addition, one of our large private employing shipyards, uh, Vigor Industrial, uh, which employs 2,700 people in the Pacific Northwest, including its yards in Portland, uh, Tacoma, Seattle, uh, and in Ketchikan. Uh, they're pursuing an $8 billion Coast Guard contract. They're very well positioned to receive that. And the oil extraction industry uh, produces about $250 million in economic activity per rig. Uh, they have one rig that was uh, doing some exploratory work this summer, but we understand that there are as many as four or five that could be planned. So the future looks, looks good here, very good, and we've done all of this without any public subsidy, uh, without any tax breaks of any kind. Uh, the vast majority of the companies involved in this trade are privately held family companies, small family companies. In fact, the largest is Vigor with 2,700 jobs. But we do have some challenges. The biggest challenge in, in my mind is the um, prescriptive regulation that's imposed upon us. And by prescriptive, I mean that a, a Washington, D.C.-based regulatory agency will come to us and say, not, we want this to be the end result, but we want you to take these steps to achieve this end result. I think it would be much more uh, effective if a regulatory agency would come to industry and say, this is the end result that we're looking for, help us achieve that end result. The Coast Guard's very good about that, but several of the other regulatory agencies, both at the federal and state level, don't take that, don't take that approach. Land use challenges. Uh, that is not so much a federal issue in my mind, it's more of a, a state, uh, county, and municipal issue. But that is a, a very big issue. We, we in the maritime industrial community 
do require protections in industrial zoning. Uh, we we ha tend to have very, very attractive uh, real estate. As Bill was telling you, the shellfish industry is moving off the waterfront because the taxes on waterfront real estate are so expensive that we do need protections there so that we can continue to maintain large pieces of contiguous industrial land adjacent to deep water, adjacent to rail, and adjacent to highways. And lastly, and one that I think that you all can help us most with, is a lack of the public's uh, knowledge, let alone appreciation, for what the maritime industrial economy represents not only to the economy of a, of a locality, uh, Seattle is a very vibrant, diverse community, but you get to uh, some of the coastal communities on the, on the coast of Washington State along the Columbia River, uh, and the maritime industrial community is, is the largest employer and a provider of sustainable family wage jobs, multi-generational jobs, that are a very high quality of life. You know, work on the water or you're building something, it's, it's a nice job. Uh, and as I mentioned at the outset, it's an cultural, culturally a very important part of our, uh, of our background and our history here in the Pacific Northwest. So I'm looking forward to the discussion and I'll turn it back over to Dick. Thanks, Peter. Let me just add a, a couple of comments. Uh, Peter alluded to the, the, what I call the heavy industrial sector of the working waterfront with the shipyards here in Puget Sound. Uh, as I indicated, that's, that's my background. Uh, one of the strengths that the heavy industrial sector brings to, this, to the discussion, or, or at least to the challenges that many of the other sectors face that, that we don't necessarily have to deal with, is we have the power of numbers, uh, large, large employment numbers. We're not talking hundreds, we're talking thousands. And that makes a world of difference when you have to go deal with the policy uh, makers. It doesn't always guarantee success, but it certainly guarantees you access when you're talking. We, we in San Diego, our, at my shipyard, we average between four and 7,000 jobs, uh, 7,000 positions over the years. So when we knock on doors, we get their intention. As I said, we don't always guarantee success. Uh, the biggest threat that we face is, is really the gentrification of the adjacent neighborhoods. In San Diego, the, California is kind of well known these days for dysfunctional government, but if you go back in time, they did a lot of things correct. And uh, one of which is the tide lines are well protected, they're all placed in public trust, uh, they cannot be sold to private sectors. And in San Diego Bay, and, and I learned that San, San Francisco Bay apparently has much the same history. Over the course of many, many decades ago, the bay was filled. So what used to be the high tide water line, there's ample land uh, outboard of that now. Uh, our shipyard sits entirely on filled land. So it's all tidelands. Uh, cannot be uh, uh, purchased for private uh, use. Uh, and it's controlled by a port authority that was established by the, the state legislator. And the Port Authority has done a tremendous job. <clears throat> They've established criteria for use. And again, as I said, it, the property can only be leased, it can't be purchased, but they have a threefold criteria for usage of that land. And it's in descending order of importance. And the first criteria is water dependent uses marine terminals, shipyards, marinas, commercial fishing, sport fishing, uh, sport fishing berthing, swimming beaches, etc. That's priority number one. The second priority is water-linked uses, uh, uses that are, do not necessarily require waterfront location, but must be located in, in uh, close proximity to the water to support the other activities. Examples are boat sales, fish markets, canneries, marine hardware sales. The third and last criteria, the lowest criteria, the lowest priority of the criteria, is waterfront enhancing. These do not require waterfront sites but can lend, lend enhancement to the waterfront. Examples of restaurants, hotels, and public recreations. Now it's this third area, uh, where, which is where people try to, uh, to, to drive a truck through. Um, I was interested in learning here in Seattle that you're, you're dealing with the issue of a new stadium, or the potential new stadium. But well, we have had for several years now a very hot topic in San Diego, uh, the need for, the, the alleged need for a new football stadium. The allegation is our beloved San Diego Chargers will leave San Diego if someone doesn't build them a new stadium somewhere. My 
great, creates a debate in itself whether we need to keep the San Diego Chargers. Based on the last few years' results, it uh, <laughs> makes it a difficult argument. Uh, but believe it or not, uh, a proposal has been made <clears throat> by a very in influential group in San Diego to take over the uh, port cargo terminal and convert it to a football stadium anchored real estate development. And it's absolutely amazing when you look at the port's criteria because there's nothing more suitable than the number one priority of a port cargo terminal. And arguably, at best, someone can argue that a football stadium would fall into priority number three where it's enhancing the waterfront at the expense of that uh, cargo terminal. Uh, to date, the Port Authority has done an excellent job of, of fending off this effort. Uh, the effort will not, unfortunately, go away. Uh, one of the reasons being it's being championed by the, the, the gentleman who owns the one and only local newspaper. So every chance the, the newspaper gets, it's put in front of the public's eyes. Uh, but the issue is best, uh, best economic use for property. And someone can generate the argument that, yes, you can generate more uh, tax revenue and economic activity with a football stadium anchored retail hotel development in lieu of a port terminal. But those activities can be placed elsewhere and not on the water, and obviously the port terminal can't. So uh, given the fact that, that the, uh, the land cannot be purchased out from under us uh, on the industrial waterfront, the biggest concern I mentioned we have is the gentrification of the neighborhoods around it. And uh, this has been alluded to in some of the breakout sessions that we experience it on an ongoing basis. But as, <clears throat> as a generalization, the neighborhoods around industrial sites were not the best neighborhoods uh, in the communities. Uh, they usually were lower income. They were somewhat neglected, uh, haven't been redeveloped. With the rising prices of real estate, uh, the lengthening of commutes, developers have refocused on those adjacent neighborhoods with the eye of upgrading them, redeveloping them, and getting a whole new uh, uh, cast of characters that would become the in industrialist neighbors. And with these new, uh, new neighbors, they have a new set of values. And the first issue is traffic, uh, the truck traffic, uh, the, the uh, employees' car traffic. Traffic leads to parking. Parking spills over into the, into the local neighborhoods. It creates conflict. Uh, you get noise. Um, we actually had to deal with, with complaints from, from the neighbors about the whistles we used to have to signify shift changes at night. We work 24 hours a day, you get a signify uh, lunch breaks, we, uh, uh, shift changes and everything. And we ultimately had to go to a very uh, uh, music-oriented uh, tones instead of a whistles to, to accommodate that. The other is lighting at night. The more people you have working at night, from safety reasons, you got more and more lights. Okay, some people will argue all well, those bright lights are not the most conducive thing to their new, more expensive uh, neighborhood that they've just created. So this is an ongoing battle. Uh, but again, one of the benefits we have that maybe others don't have is that that large employment base uh, and the economic activity we, we create generates a lot of support at the policymakers' uh, decisions. So anyway, with that, uh, I want to open up a question first. Is there anything that our, our panelists would like to challenge each other? Uh, in, in terms of issues that where one of your sectors might uh, uh, conflict with another, recreational boating and aquaculture, for example. Uh, are there issues that, uh, that exist between you folks and how do you envision those being resolved? Uh, uh, so I guess I would have a question uh, for Rick or maybe an opportunity. You know, I, uh, a lot of the working waterfronts focus, I think, has been around legislation to try to address this at a national level, but I think there's a lot of opportunity, frankly, uh, just for uh, networking collaboration between the different user groups. And, and so here in Washington, uh, the Clean Boating Foundation, I see Peter Schrappen in the audience here. He and I have been working together lately on, on how to strengthen that partnership between the boating community and our industry, uh, whether it be through us serving as a poster child for uh, trying to get away from copper-based bottom paints uh, and, and demonstrating some of the new products because obviously we're a benefactor of that. Uh, or on the uh, boater pump outs to try to get recreational boaters to, to uh, use the boater pump outs. We're sort of a reason for that. If people like to eat oysters, maybe they'll want to use the pump outs more. Uh, you know, those kind of partnerships. And, and I'm just wondering if that stimulates any, any thinking on your behalf on, on types of things that we might be able to do on a national scale. Yeah, I would, I would 
was thinking about your industry, and, and you, you go to work, you don't go to work by boat, you go by truck, right? Uh, both. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was, that was surprising to me. Uh, well, water quality and, and uh, clean environment to go boating in is always a priority with, with our uh, industry, our, our, our members. Uh, and we have been on the front of advocating for things like the Clean Vessel Act that provides those pump outs. Uh, I know uh, there, there's a discussion now about uh, making Puget Sound a no discharge zone. I don't know how that stacks up. Yeah, I don't know the details, uh, but you have to have the, um, uh, the EPA has to uh, ensure that there are enough pump outs available to uh, handle the traffic. And that's often uh, the problem. We don't have enough pump outs available or in the right locations or in deep enough water to get the boats in and all those things. So that's, that's the kind of thing that uh, your local groups can advocate, sure, we support that. One yes. comment I'd like to make it, uh, excuse me. No, no, today. Go ahead. I, was, I was just gonna say, um, we're having a lot of discussions right now about um, the way that the ocean is changing, the way that species are shifting, and there's certainly a growing interest um, in, in income diversification and looking at aquaculture and um, particularly for some of these smaller communities, there seems to be kind of a, grow, a groundswell emerging around the, I know um, Sea Grant's working very hard on supporting this, but it would seem that as part of the, it, it, I, I don't know that um, we've done a good enough job yet of connecting the two as part of a working waterfront agenda specifically. So I think there's an opportunity there as well. And I know um, Sebastian's working on this in our state and, and some other folks. It's definitely, I mean, I think as you saw from my presentation, for some of our rural Western Washington communities, it's very key. Uh, some of them, some of those communities, I don't think really understand and appreciate the significance of that economic contribution. And so we're trying to find, as I mentioned, other ways to engage them, which has been beneficial to them as well through these shellfish festivals and, and different events that we do, fundraising, you know, we're out there giving away our shellfish liberally to uh, multiple different events as fundraising. That's easy for us to do and gets attention in a positive way and, and, and you know, builds support around this. I mean, there's, there's amazing opportunities. As Peter talked about in the commercial boating industry, uh, uh, our, ours has grown as well through the recession we had a little slump in our domestic markets, but our export markets took off at the same time, and our sales have continued to grow through the recession. Our challenge has been able to get permits to grow the farms. That's why we're located in British Columbia now, is we couldn't get permits here in Washington. So, so we've spent $10 million over the last eight years buying existing farms in Canada and now have 100 employees in Canada trying to fill that demand. So we're trying to you know, build broader public and political will to support aquaculture here in Washington and, and to the extent that we can work with local communities to demonstrate those benefits, we'd like to do that. I would like to make a point out a distinction between uh, finfish aquaculture and shellfish aquaculture. I, I wish there were a different name for, for them because they're very different types of harvesting. Um, we at at Fisherman's News, which is an ag advocacy uh, paper, uh, we actively get involved in policy discussions. We've been very supportive of Taylor Shellfish and, and their battles with a variety of different uh, uh, regulatory agencies. But we have not taken the, the same supportive role with finfish aquaculture, and, and we believe that the two are very different. Uh, shellfish aquaculture is harvesting an existing resource in an existing environment, not changing it. Um, but finfish aquaculture is introducing something, a non-native, and hoping to corral it, feeding it with artificial foods and changing it with dyes. And we think that that may or may not be safe. It may or may not be safe, but we're not sure yet, and I don't think anybody is sure. So that's a, a distinction that maybe warrants discussion, maybe not in this uh, arena, but further discussion. Does anybody want to pick up on that particular uh, issue?
But I have to observe, and, and we have all the respect in the world for the shellfish industry on the West Coast, most of the oysters produced in Washington are non-native oysters. Uh, they happen to be fitting in fine with the industry, but I had to make that distinction. Uh, we tried to go non-native in Virginia with no success at all. Thank you. My, my dad used to say, my dad was the editor of Fisherman's News and started in the industry in 62, and he used to say that uh, oysters were the first invasive species. They, they came over with a lot of them, correct me if I'm wrong here, but they came a lot, a lot of the uh, shellfish came over on the hulls of the ships that were trading across the Pacific, and so y you're right, there's, I think, the one native oyster species. So, so I, will, I will correct you on that. I mean, a lot of those introductions were intentional uh, as we struggled to grow the native oyster, which is a very delicate oyster to farm in the face of the pulp industry's pollution. That was an inspiration for introducing the Pacific oyster very intentionally to give us a hardier oyster that would grow in, in the polluted waters. Let me make a comment, just to, takes us in a little different direction, but it was something Rick started off with where he, he showed his, his picture of the large container ship and, and the sailboat uh, getting in its way. Uh, and he was commenting on what I would refer to as a changing landscape, at least of the major ports, due to the widening of Panama Canal and due to the, the enlarging of the, of the uh, international ship fleet. And I, I'm just raising the question, maybe some of the port people would hear it have, have some thoughts on it. But obviously the Panama Canal is, is being widened. There will be larger ships. They will now sail straight through uh, from, from Asia to the East Coast in lieu of coming to the West Coast ports. There's dramatic expansion going on in the East Coast ports to accommodate that. Now the question I have, and it's something I, I would be interested in people's thoughts, but I would be concerned that we keep our eye on, are we creating more capacity uh, than is going to be needed? Uh, the East Coast people are very anxious to have those ships arrive. The West Coast people aren't talking too much about what they're going to lose in the process. International trade will undoubtedly continue to grow, but my concern is the East Coast ports are being expanded at a far greater rate than X years of, of normal uh, expansive of international trade. And what, if any, implication that has for the changing landscape of the, of the waterfront? I, I don't know, but maybe the port people might have a comment on that. Uh, one of the one of the consequences of these triple E ships, these 18,000 TEU ships, is going to be that not many ports are going to be able to handle them. And Bill Mangaluso's uh, from the Journal of Commerce um, made a presentation a couple of weeks ago where he said, uh, you know, we're basically going to end up with four major load centers in the U.S. Seattle, Tacoma, L.A., Long Beach. Uh, New York, New Jersey, and probably Virginia because of Hampton Roads. Uh, these ships draw at least 50 feet of water. And uh, it's just, uh, you know, the infrastructure required is not simply um, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, ship channel depth, but also the support facilities uh, along the shoreline. And uh, um, I'm not so sure that there's going to be an awful lot of cargo diversion from the West Coast to the East Coast. I, I think there will be, uh, what will happen will be there will be traffic from Asia to the East Coast directly. I don't actually think the Panama Canal is going to make all that much difference. So, for what it's worth. So, something to keep a eye on. Uh, I have a series of questions that have been handed me if I can, if I can read those. Economic development discussion. Is there a shortage of labor? Uh, for these skilled jobs, what is the role of the educational institutions in, in the pipeline to these jobs? Can I address that, uh, Jim's comment first about the load sure. centers? Uh, the, there are, we do conferences on that very issue about the, the impact of the Panama Canal and the larger ships. Uh, and we've been doing the same conference since 1985 on the impact of larger ships and the infrastructure that's required. Uh, so it's an ongoing issue. At one of our conferences about three years ago, the uh, president of the Chinese National Railway spoke. He's a Harvard-educated Chinese national. And he told us that within 10 years, China would be pushing out 60 million TEUs to the Pacific, well, 60 million TEUs. About half of that traffic would be going uh, coastwide 
uh, along um, what we call the, uh, the Western Pacific, which is Asia. So we're going to get 30 to 35 million TEUs just from China. Currently, our ports have the ca capacity, including the new Canadian ports, to handle about 12 million TEUs. So uh, the East Coast can have all they want and all they can handle, and we're still going to have more than we can handle. The question, as Jim said, is do we have the uh, political will to make those terminal expansions, expansions and then the infrastructure upland to adapt that. It's easy to bring containers over, but it's really, really hard to transload them uh, and put them on overland transportation. That's the real big question. Can I do the, the uh, workforce development one too? Just, just, just a comment. Uh, I'm, the, I'm viewed as a perennial optimist, and when we hear these large numbers of projections from containers in, uh, transiting from China to, to the, the U.S., uh, insourcing is the new buzzword. And I am optimistic that we're going to gradually see an increasing trend of insourcing that replaces the outsourcing that's giving rise to all that manufacturing being done in China and brought over here. And that will, that will mitigate that problem and will be a tremendous benefit to this, to this country if, in fact, it, it, it arrives. But anyway, to your work, first of all. Well, and, and also the, the increase in exports. You know, I, I wish there were some, some container port people here that could talk to us about how um, the export balance has been has been wonderful in the last four or five years because we are uh, insourcing and, and as we develop the expertise to insource then we develop the ability to uh, inexpensively, inexpensively produce quality products that we can then ship to consumers on the other side of the Pacific. So, uh, Workforce development, huge issue in the maritime community right now. Uh, the average age of the maritime industrial worker here in Puget Sound is 54 years and they're really good jobs. The problem that we have is that they are very often jobs that happen outside of the uh, outside of the public visibility. If you if you drive through the wheat fields of Iowa, you see what's going on there, and kids can say, "Hey, that looks like something I'd like to do." Um, cattle farming, the same thing. Uh, even steel working, you, you you see these things happening in the maritime industry. Everything happens far, far away from public view. When I was a kid uh, in Seattle. Fully half of my high school class did what I did in the summers. We went to Alaska and worked on fishing boats. Uh, now, more than half of the people that live here came here as adults from elsewhere, and they just don't have that cultural connection to the maritime industry, don't impart it upon their children, and so we don't have that uh, connection to the workforce that we need. That said, because of our stellar, um, uh, stellar uh, economic activity through the recession, Public policymakers uh, are appreciating that there is something here that they can that they can get their arms around, and we have a whole host of workforce development initiatives. We don't have anything implemented yet, but we have a whole host of workforce development initiatives that are happening around here. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We we definitely have a need as an industry as well. You know, our, uh, within our company. Our supervisors are typically super workers that have worked their way up through the ranks. A lot of times have a high school education uh, and we end up sending them to the local community college to try to give them math and computer and budgeting skills to be able to run our farms. So we've been trying to rectify that working with local colleges. Bellingham Technical College has an aquaculture program. We're trying to expand to do more with shellfish aquaculture, and, but we definitely have a, have a need there. I'll just quickly, there's a very active discussion about this in the state of Maine um, in particular where uh, there's some really innovative work going on in particular around um, training for future in aquaculture. There's tra um, training go both uh, fin fish and shellfish aquaculture, but also, um, you know, there's, there's an increasing awareness that, um, that schools no longer need to be exclusively focused on college prep, but on prepping for the jobs that are actually there. And so... Um, a lot of our own work, even in scholarship making and so forth, is really targeting now Maine Maritime and places that are producing jobs that are actually, frankly, doing much better than most of the kids that are spending a lot of time and money elsewhere. I'll just comment from the California sector that uh, Californian and Infant Wisdom several years ago decided that every child should go to college and they effectively dismantled the vocational education aspect of the, of the secondary education system. Uh, did not augur well for folks like us in the shipyard who we don't necessarily need college graduates. We need skilled, tr trained, skilled technicians to work there. So 
we have spent an enormous amount of money over the years to develop in-house training programs. Our challenge is to get people to come in the door. But when we come in the door, we've got a four-year training program where it's, it's sort of a partnership. They'll invest their time and we invest our money. And as they progress through the training, they will, in, they will receive salary increases, wage increases at each step along the way. Uh, we also have uh, integrated ourselves with the local community colleges where our employees can take their college courses right on, on the shipyard site and, and lead to a, a AA degree in shipbuilding manufacturing. Um, so we, we work very hard at it. We actually developed our own high school uh, and ran our own high school on the shipyard in conjunction with one of the, school, the local school districts for a couple years. It was very intriguing that kids came down there and they were, they were sort of the dropout potential. Uh, some of them actually told the stories where the, the counselor says, you're hopeless, you know, why are you wasting your time in school? They came down, went to school, the, the, the school district would send the uh, academic teachers over to teach in our yard, and then our trainers would take the, the, the kids out and work in the shipyard for their skills training. And it was absolutely amazing, the transformation with these kids. They became interested. Uh, you had to cut a saddle and a pipe fitting. How to do math. These kids went back in the classroom and asked the teacher, how do I do this? I wanted to learn math. It was unbelievable. But it takes a conscious effort uh, for the industry to, 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 to step in and, and fill in the, the gap that the education system is not, uh, not filling for us. I'm sorry, Rick, you were going to add something? I just, the, the boating industry, back when times were really flush, they had done an awful lot to encourage those kinds of skilled trades, which pay very good uh, salaries compared to what was being replaced, you know, in the residential development. Um, and as, as uh, times get better and boat sales go up, I think we'll see that too because uh, there was a, a, a time when they just couldn't uh, find the, the workers to, to, to build boats or to uh, outfit them or to you know, set them up. So we're looking for that to come back. With that. And a lot of that infrastructure is still there through community college systems and so forth. So that's waiting as the industry comes back. Another question I received up here is many vocal people tend to push back against any commercial activity on waterfronts because it does not look natural. Uh, can the panelists address an example of that pushback and how it was or was not solved? Well, that's why I wasn't here yesterday. It's because I was at a public hearing <laughs> for a gooey duck farm listening to uh, a lot of that. Uh, and, and it's just a not, you know, it's an ongoing education piece. It's actually one for us. Uh, education probably is the biggest uh, part of it. And it's one, uh, one of our state representatives, uh, Larry Sequest, who kind of lives in the heart of controversy for gooey duck farming, uh, introduced a bill this session to do just that, to create an education center using Sea Grant as the educator to bring information, accurate information, about the environmental effects of shellfish farming and just to create a dialogue between the shellfish farmers and the community, which is great. Uh, unfortunately, the bill died, uh, but I, we, we laud his efforts. He took a, a lot of abuse for it from some of these shoreline owners that didn't feel like he went far enough in his bill. But, you know, we've done things. We continue to do things. We, we all uh, respond. Uh, differently to criticism, but from our standpoint, we've benefited tremendously from it. You know, so we started out with those gooey duck nursery tubes used to be white, and it was startling. It was an aesthetic, you know, they were, within three weeks, they're covered with algae and they're brown, but for those three weeks, we got a lot of calls, you know. So we went to the pipe manufacturer and said, can you make us some gray pipe, you know, and then we just, a lot of things like that, uh, th 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 to try to make things uh, visually pleasing. Neat and orderly. We have codes of practices within the industry. You know, you can put things out there in a cluttered fashion, disorganized fashion, and get a lot of complaints. But if you get everything out there in a straight line and in the same color, you reduce those complaints, and and people are are, are more accepting of it. So those types of things, we're constantly learning and evolving to try to uh, make it fit. You know, it's it's interesting. You know, the the the, the dairy industry in Washington State faced those user conflicts as people moved in next to the dairy farms and didn't like the smell of the cow, the cow poop. Uh, and the dairies moved out and they went to eastern Washington where there was more space. Well, we don't have that luxury. We have to be able to grow our shellfish here in Puget Sound. So we're really actively looking for solutions to make it fit. I, I recall uh, during the waterfront land rush around the Chesapeake Bay where I am that um, 
these, as these small waterfront uh, or watermen's communities, the, the, the crabbers, oystermen, were being gentrified, people were coming and moving in, uh, that the real estate industry was savvy enough to begin to educate the consumer and I think even put in language in some of the uh, contracts. You've got to remember, if you're going to live here, those guys get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and they start their dry stack engines. And uh, if you want to live here, you got to understand that and accept it. And, and I think they did a pretty good job. I can't remember exactly where that was done. Uh, it was in Maryland and Virginia. And that, I think that, that is something that maybe the Sea Grant kind of community can help to educate too. Well, I'll just uh, briefly say that we have a, a saying in Maine that when the commercial fishing industry makes common cause with the seasonal residents, um, anybody who's in opposition might as well just get out of the way. So um, there's a lot of, and, and that's, there's a current situation where that's really um, kind of highlighted. There's been a lot of work done in the state of Maine by a number of different organizations and agencies around the sighting of offshore wind, which are these gigantic floating turbines. There's been a, a, a really thoughtful and extensive public discussion. Um, and it's not resolved, but everybody understands the terms of the debate. Um, there's also an LPG tank sighting discussion um, at the head of Penobscot Bay that was done quietly and carefully. And whether or not it's the right thing to do, everybody's up in arms and the seasonal residents are taking side with the commercial fishermen and they'll, they'll, they'll make it so painful and expensive to cite that sucker that it's gonna, you know, it, that's, the, that's the absolute, and it could have been avoided if the same, if we kind of took the opportunity to have a thoughtful, informed discussion about what exactly the benefits of that terminal would be. And so um, it really speaks to the value of, of this kind of forum and the forums that Sea Grant and others are holding to get this information out there because these are really complex issues and they're very hard to make and they're, it's very easy to make snap decisions if you don't have the information. I just offer a comment on that from the shipyard point of view that it's, it's hard for me to understand but there's some people out there that don't feel shipyards are very sightly. Uh, uh, so we deal with that. Uh, but one of the solutions to that is I've never seen a young kid, particularly a young boy, who hasn't had, who were given the opportunity to see cranes lift massive things, so on and so forth, that don't get tremendously excited about what goes on in the shipyard. And there's the epitome of that, the ultimate of that is seeing an old fashioned traditional ship launching down in inclined ways. Mm -hmm. To the extent you can get kids to come in and see what goes on in that shipyard, to the extent their parents ever start bad mouthing the unsightliness of their shipyard, I got a vocal advocate in their family that says, <laughs> I think that's kind of neat stuff. All right, we have time for one more question. If there's, if there's any more questions from the, from the floor, we're, we've pushed our limit here. Um, if not, we'll buy you some time. And uh, again, I want to thank our panelists for, for participating today. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to take a moment, I want to thank you, Dick, for moderating this, and I want to thank the four of you for agreeing to do this. We brought together very unlikely partners that, to the table to say, these are the faces of working waterfronts, and it's very diverse, and it's a very messy conversation, but it's one that needs to be had. However, before we have that next conversation, I am going to give everybody a break. So what we've done is we've run over a little bit on this conversation. We want to come back and then talk with all of you about more of thoughts and ideas of what you want to see as strategies, what are key themes, et cetera. Uh, if you're a moderator, if you are one of the facilitators for the conversation, please come up to the front here. If not, please take a 10-minute break. I'm going to call everybody back in at 10.40, uh, 10.50, and we will start in on our conversation then. Thank you. <laughs>